Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Print Circuit podcast, where we discuss trends, challenges, and opportunities across the Print Circuit engineering industry. I'm your host, Steph Chavez. On this episode, we have a very special guest, Robert Terzo, Principal Hardware PCB Designer for Polaro Technologies, to talk to us about his experience as a PCB designer and a multi-board PCB design that was just featured as one of the winners of the Siemens Accelerator Technology Innovation Award. Robert, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Can you introduce yourself and share your background with our audience? So I'm in the electronic design industry since uh, my early ages, uh, came to Canada 96, uh, started to work as uh, the electronic designer, went through several different uh, design tool flows, found uh, that I was uh, lucky enough uh, to very early get access to expedition tools, originally first with uh, Board Station DX, and from there moved uh, to Expedition Enterprise 2007. And as uh, we go up, uh, came to Expedition VX releases. uh, And over there, I was from uh, really very first days uh, as the Expedition VX showed up. You and I have very similar experience with the the length of time that we've been using uh, the Expedition Tool Suite. Let me ask you, one of your designs won the first place in the multi-board system design category at the Siemens Accelerate Technology Innovation Award. Can you share with us what was unique about your design or that particular design? Before uh, Pleura accepted uh, uh, to do that design, we had uh, a very specific uh, customer who give us uh, upfront very tight constraints. The constraints are uh, driven in a small box what uh, should be embedded uh, into the uh, armored vehicle. They are requirement to be able to deliver in the uh, same box uh, 13 different uh, variants of their products they need. So I came first with the idea, okay, if you need so many different variants, it does not make sense to build uh, 13 different boards what will uh, go inside, especially because uh, there is so many features what you can simply buy on a smaller mini PCI card uh, for uh, embedded computing. And we have to turn uh, to meet the deadline to buy some of those uh, from uh, our media and etc. So I came across, okay, if we have a platform and start plugging in the card and whatever we cannot buy on market, I will design in-house then uh, we're going to get uh, much easier. We're using a uh, high-end uh, NVIDIA Jetson TX2i uh, module, what is meant to work as uh, the uh, AI front-end uh, can do a lot of the things and have uh, a tremendous amount of number of uh, high-speed uh, signals. High-speed signals, uh, they ranging uh, up to several gigabits per second uh, per line. Of course, nothing is easy as it is. Uh, You need to add a PCI Express switch on it so you can uh, spread out the signals. You need to make a separate clock distribution signal. Everything is time sensitive, time constrained, and no space. And of course, you need to cool them down. Oh, of course. And on top of that, they want it the least expensive and they want it yesterday. (laughs) And of course, they want to be able to reuse the product in other areas so that way it saves them money and the constraints just go on and on and on. I think the biggest challenge, as you mentioned, is the speeds you're running at and having to deal with multiple boards within that stack up or within that build because you're traversing signals from one board to the other to the other. And it can pose quite a challenge, especially when you're talking about signal quality and potential EMI issues that you're going to run up against. So tell me, what do you think was your biggest challenge when it came to that particular PCB design? The biggest challenge is uh, early on beginning, I figured it out uh, that the faceplate will stand vertically and then uh, beside the faceplate will uh, sit a number of horizontal boards. Doing interconnect between multiple boards in vertical stack toward the faceplate where are mounted all the big 3899 connectors are uh, impossible with it uh, without flex PCB. And then uh, starting a fun. You need uh, to run uh, from, let's say, uh, 18 layer rigged PCB to the high speed connector. 
then uh, through the flex portion of PCB to reach the rigid portion of uh, the PCB where sitting the connectors. The inputs uh, again uh, need to go through the flex PCB from the same face plate uh, to get uh, into the uh, layer where the capture card sitting then uh, was started an intense uh, day and night simulation of hyperlinks uh, how to put that together getting from a uh, connector vendors uh, desk parameter models for the uh, connector create a dummy board uh, just route uh, x amount of traces on it so you can uh, test them measure them against the cross talk uh, insertion loss return loss and all those stuff uh, so basically the PCB itself wouldn't be complicated if you don't want to try to run a, a six gigahertz frequency component through it without losses. Sure. Being that I was one of the judges in that contest, you know, I seen your design and reviewed it very thoroughly and it covers the full spectrum when you think about industry best practices that you had to implement in order to design that product. It's amazing. So can you tell me in general, when it comes to PCB design, what do you think are your biggest challenges in general, you know, when it comes to PC design, not just that design, but throughout your experience in, in, in where you've gone today? The first thing is uh, you need to know who will physically fabricate uh, your future PCB you even didn't start. And then uh, when you, as you started drafting a schematic, then uh, you roughly have an idea about how dense that board gonna to be. And uh, soon you can figure it out, uh, can you route that board on 12, 14, 16, 18, 26 layer board, it doesn't matter. You need to turn to the PCB fab and ask them to create you a manufacturable stack up uh, based on the properties you choose. So you here is the moment where uh, you're choosing a material. It can be just a cheap uh, FR408 uh, HR, or you need to go through the Amectron 6 material or go even more funky materials, but you need to define that one. I'm uh, technically from uh, very beginning uh, entering uh, a stack up uh, straight into the uh, schematic and trying to figure it out the properties uh, of uh, the uh, traces uh, back and forth and uh, literally in constraint manager start constraining so as i routing uh, differential pairs right away pulling them in certain group in constraint manager assigning all the properties uh, whatever however the design does not go like that you wanted to start with a blank canvas uh, wrote a couple of differential single-ended pairs, uh, spaced them on different ways, pushed them through the uh, connector so you can have something what you can export actually in hyperlinks, try it out, run the signal. So if it's, uh, your maximum signal path is, uh, I don't know, 120, 180 millimeter length of uh, the differential pairs, and that going through the uh, two PCBs and having a connector between of it, that uh, you need very careful to model in hyperlinks, put everything together right away. The first board design is not done, but you already running uh, your uh, idea stud feasibility study, how you're gonna to run that signal and defining, uh, okay, this signal is enough good to go through the uh, whole length. Once time you found out that one, you're scaling back, uh, and uh, moving to the uh, design back, uh, applying everything you learn over there, entering in Constraint Manager. However, a sketch router in this situation playing unprecedented uh, help because you're trying to figure it out how to get from A to B. It's not just a router trace. Many times you want to route them through certain path uh, to avoid certain stuff and so on. You draw the marker line, say routed and uh, job is done. Something what uh, I experienced in uh, another uh, design tools can be very painful. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, what you described is the approach that most of us are implementing, you know, when we talk about best practice and how you're attacking a design. Again, you know, you mentioned about specific, not specific design tools, but the design tools out there, some have strengths and weaknesses in, in what they do. So applying, you know, the best practices is, is utilizing the automation and the constraints and moving in that regard. I think 
I love the fact that you were talking about uh, getting with your fabricator up front and, and uh, getting that stack up locked in place and then doing your, your what if scenarios and your routing to see what does it look like? How does it go? And then you lock them down and as you move from one, one set of diff pairs or one signals to the other. And then uh, once time you move actual design toward the PCB design, so toward the, the layout, and I would call that uh, my first uh, digital twin. I can move them over there and then uh, trying to lock uh, the major component to what I cannot move around. And of course, uh, everything happening real time in 2 and in 3D. As soon as I have uh, the board outline, what or I getting from mechanical designer backward or I providing them with uh, the board outline, so I pushing uh, the whole step file to mechanical designer and they mechanically starting to laying up and preparing uh, how will be the heat sink actually designed for it. Because if you have uh, in vertical stack uh, three big PCBs, they all will eventually by end of the day dissipate certain amount of heat. And those heat cannot go up, you cannot put a fan in, you cannot do nothing. So you need to spread them aside and then uh, by the side of the box uh, dissipate uh, that heat because uh, cooling must be passive in this exact design what I did. What you describe is, is the digital twin. You're talking about multidiscipline and multi-domain collaboration between you know, mechanical and electrical. And then you have your simulation engineers that uh, the discipline that what you're doing. And that's awesome. To achieve this type of success, as we incorporate or, or the requirement to incorporate the best practices into your design, can you highlight some of the PCB design best practices that you use when you're tackling projects like the awards that you just won or, or any other difficult type project? PCB stack up making a very important role, careful choosing a placement and the routing of uh, the board. It's many times happening that uh, if I contract out uh, to finalize the board routing to layout uh, design shop, majority of nets are already ro routed and locked. So I say, uh, don't touch. And then uh, when I already have enough elements, it's going back and forth between uh, hyperlinks uh, and correction on the layout. Because if you try to run, uh, I have uh, multiple uh, co-planner waveguides on that board. But the disadvantage is that uh, the co-planner waveguides uh, has to run uh, on 75 ohm because it's a video signals. So you cannot uh, run a ground plane on uh, adjacent uh, plane in the uh, vertical stack. So you need to move them away, cut a hole out, and that's uh, preparing a, a new challenge in uh, hyperlinks, uh, how to model that all together and just run that portion and say, okay, this looks like 75 ohm, but then you're facing a challenge of insertion and return loss. You need to have enough white traces to minimize the insertion loss and a good path to maximize the return loss. I agree. I think this is where uh, you're working with your fabricator to make sure you know which reference layer you need to reference to in order to hit your target impedance, whether it's 50 ohms, 100 ohms, 75 ohms, or even like a 120 ohm can uh, bus. It's significantly important that uh, you, you design that in with your fabricator and lock that in. So that way you can attach the constraints correctly, as you described. What about like sketch routing or the automation and routing? And you talked about MCAD ECAD collaboration. I like what you said about the, the routing uh, specifically regarding like you try it and maybe do some what if scenarios. And that's good. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that, especially regarding the verification and simulation regarding, you know, hyperlinks? For single board, uh, it's straightforward, documented everything on the web and uh, so on. People doing it, uh, start doing it widely, but not enough. But when it came uh, to multi-board uh, simulation, I have up to possible 14 PCBs uh, joined into the uh, single box. Then uh, you need to have uh, for each board an S parameter file for each type of connector you're using. you mapping down up everything. It can take easily days just to put up uh, the model how you're going to run it. And uh, luckily Expedition is a great tool. 
I can always go back, fix it, just forward, annotate them, re-export everything and uh, use the whole press settings uh, from previous uh, moment uh, to get there. But it is a lot of the calculation and uh, that's really becoming uh, the whole expedition design flow with hyperlinks becoming just a very powerful engineering tool. Personally, I love, uh, and I think you would agree, that the, the integration between hyperlinks and expedition, even when you step back and think of the full ecosystem uh, that uh, Siemens provides within the expedition suite with you know, hyperlinks, Valor, you know, and Validate. And it's nice to be in one ecosystem. You don't have to leave you know, that database. You're right in there and, and be able to do it on the fly is key. I think um, the biggest thing that I love is being able to handle changes and not really be negatively impacted so much when changes come. Because you and I both know, especially when you're dealing with multiple boards, that change is inevitable. You constantly have to be adapting to change, especially with supply chain issues that are happening where components are available, then they're not available, and you're going to have to take a, one step forward, two steps backwards. The idea is how fast you can recover. Would you agree is, is being able to do that? What role do the tools uh, like Expedition and Hyperlinks play in getting your designs to market? I was... Probably one of the lucky expedition users who managed to push not one, but multiple boards uh, with uh, a revision into their production. And that explains a lot of them. So you're getting very high level of uh, confidence uh, that when you hand over uh, a design to fabrication, that should work out of the box. And I started forgetting skills of uh, debugging the board. Yeah, I hear you. It happens to the best of us. One of the biggest things is, is utilizing the automation that we have in our CAD tools. I think those of us who are willing to utilize that power that's there and use it to our advantage. I mean, I'm not saying that you can auto route or auto place or do uh, everything by just one push of a button. It's not that easy. And I think you would agree to that. It's a matter of controlling that power and, and doing it in spurts. And then you'd route some signals, check it, analyze it. They're good, lock it, and then move to the next, then move to the next. And like I said, one of the biggest things that I love about the automation is being able to take a hit regarding a change. And it, it, the impact isn't so much as if I have to make that change manually and reroute all that stuff manually again. That's where I think the automation really comes in handy of being able to do a lot of one-if scenarios. And I think you described that. To add on that, I would say that the real-time dynamic DRC tracker first uh, prevents you to do stupid things. <laughs> and for B, if, even if you manage to do it, uh, it will flag you an easy found where you mess up and uh, fix them. Yep, I, I agree with you. And Lord knows that uh, I've done uh, you know foolish things in the past. And luckily, I, I, I used a powerful tool that, that has prevented me from pushing that into uh, fabrication. But uh, the, the tools are there and uh, use it to your advantage. That's what I say. There's no way you wouldn't have been able to, to uh, not utilize those best practices to, to produce that award-winning project that you submitted had you done all that stuff manually, especially the time constraint you're under and then to meet your customer's requirements is huge. You know, as an experienced designer, what is some of your advice you'd give to the new generation that's just starting in, in, in their careers today within our industry? Most of it, I would uh, advise them to Use the tool even outside the working hours. Try out new features. Learn the tool. As more you know about uh, the tool and how it's working, the more successful you're going to be. Because uh, there are uh, so many undocumented uh, hidden features, uh, I start uh, pushing them in the category of uh, abusing a tool. I have shortcuts how I can uh, successfully do stuff what uh, I can solve uh, within hours these days uh, and with uh, another uh, design tool houses will probably need to spend a couple of weeks to just do that. You know, I couldn't agree with you more about the, you know, what you're saying, especially regarding learning the tool and using it to your advantage. I mean, you're absolutely right. I couldn't agree with you more. In my career, especially when I attend industry uh, conferences, I'm amazed to listen and hear people still stay within their comfort zone of the same 20 clicks that they use in designing. And it's amazing because some of these people are using Expedition or they're using uh, you know, the leading tools and 
they still are using very common functions and they're not using like utilizing the full horsepower of their tool. It just amazes me uh, the reluctancy to step outside that comfort zone and, comfort zone and grow. And, and I agree. I, I'd give the same advice to new generation engineers is to learn your tool and, and to step out of your comfort zone and learn the tool and use it to your advantage. I use this, this phrase about you can get 18 hours of effort in eight, eight hours if you utilize the power in the tool. You don't have to work those long hours unless you choose to, but you can really get a lot more done in less time if you take the chance and utilize the uh, automation that's there. And I think you would agree with me on that. Absolutely, yes. Because uh, there are uh, so many and uh, Siemens continuously adding new stuff, adding new features and making engineering life much easier as the time goes by. And we need to take advantage of it, but it's all required X amount of hours spending just to have fun with the tool. I agree with you. And especially when you think about the new generation, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? And learning your tool and using it to your advantage is only going to benefit you individually. But in reality, when you get hired into employer, it benefits your employer, which in turn ripples back down to you. It's a win-win for everyone. I think uh, always sharpening your skill set and mastering your craft is, is key as uh, the new generation is evolving. And then you got old guys like you and me who are continuously sharpening our blades, even though you know we're on the, the second half of our career, but we're still hungry. We're still pushing the envelope. And I love it. I love it. So I got to tell you, uh, Robert, there's some great advice you gave. I want to thank you for your time and invaluable insight today. You're very welcome, sir. So to our audience, keep following the Printed Circuit podcast for more discussions on trends, challenges, and opportunities across the Printed Circuit engineering industry.